We're continuing to learn our Chatzai Yosef class, B'Zat Hashem, the book that we had as a to put together. Here's the book. It is for sale right now. Anyone who's interested, please email me at my name, yosefzayrav at gmail.com. We'd be happy to arrange that. We could send it to anywhere in the world. Um, people have been giving me a very, very good reviews, Baruch Hashem, from all over the place. People have ordered from Germany, from Miami, from Australia, other places as well, Louisiana. So please, don't be shy. We would love to share our bit of Torah with you. We are in chapter 8 of the Sefer, Jerusalem Withering is the name of the chapter. It's the, the explanations of the tragedies that are happening inside Yerushalayim as the siege is going on, as the Romans are sieging around the, the city. And last week we got up to page 81. We're going to pick up from there the Ben Yehuyada, his commentary on this Gemara. Let me just read the Gemara one more time quickly, because every time I like, at the beginning of the... Uh, of the Shi'ur, I'd like to just mention the Gemara that we're talking about, so anyone who's clicking on this for the first time uh, knows more or less what the topic is. Even though this is the part four, we're going to just read the first part of the Gemara quickly on page 77. Rome sent Vespasian Caesar. Vespasian was the army general. At that time, he was the army general. Uh, they sent him against Judea, against the Jews, where they were living. You know, the southern, modern-day Israel is called Judea at the time. He came and he laid siege on Yerushalayim for three years. There were those three rich men in Yerushalayim, Naktimon ben Gurion, Kalba, ben Kalba Savua, and ben Tzitzite Kesit. The first one was called Naktimon ben, ben Gurion because the son Nakda pierced for his, for his sake. Right? His name is, uh, explains why, uh, why his name was, that, was what it was. We explained you know, in, in the first Shi'ur what it was. It's in note 5 over here, the story behind his name. The second one was called Ben Kalba Savua, because anyone who entered in his house starving like a Kelev, or Kalba in Aramaic, would leave Savua, satiated. The third one was called Ben Tzitzit Keset, because his Tzitziot, the fringes of his garment, would drag upon Kesetot, cushions, fancy cushions. Some say it was because his, his Keset, meaning his seat, where he actually sat, was placed amongst the greats of Rome. Some say it was the greats of Yerushalayim. One of them, some say it was both. Maharal said both are true. He was in high places, basically. One of them said to the others, I will sustain them with wheat and barley. He's talking about, you know, the people who, the Jewish people who are sieged, stuck inside. He's saying, I will contribute, I will give everybody wheat and barley from my stash, from my resources. The other one said, I will sustain them with wine, salt, and oil. And the other one said, I will sustain them with wood. And the rabbis praised the one most, the one who gave the wood, as Rav Chasta would give all his keys to all of his storehouses, to his servant. He entrusted his keys to his servant, except for the one for wood. The storehouse that kept the wood, he wouldn't give the key that opened that door to his servant. Why? Since Rav Chasta said, a storehouse of wheat requires 60 storehouses of wood. The wood was the most valuable. They had enough resources in Yerushalayim, to, uh, thanks to these three rich men, to sustain the city for 21 years. But as fate would have it, that's not what actually happened. There were certain baryonim, they're called baryonim, they're zealots, they're passionate, uh, you know, a, a group of uh, fighters, who basically were like gangsters, who ran the city, forcibly, among the people in Yerushalayim. The sages said to them, let us go out and make peace with the Romans, but the zealots did not allow them to do so. The, the zealots, or the baryonim, said to the sages, let us go out and make battle with the Romans. The sages said to them, the matter will not be successful. The zealots arose and burnt down the storehouses of wheat and barley. And then there was famine. And that's why they couldn't last for 21 years, because they literally destroyed their own resources. See the Binyah Hoyada now it says over here, page 81. The siege, along with which comes hunger, lasted for... Specifically three years. That was one of the questions. Why three years? Why did Hashem make it this way? The Maharal had very deep answers to that. Look at last week's part, part three of this uh, series. But the Binyamin says, Because the sin of the people, which was sinful speech that caused their division, is set side by side with the three cardinal sins, the three, you know, severe sins of idolatry, idol worship, sexual immorality, and murder. Well, these three, I mean, these three are things that a person is not allowed to, to uh, not allowed to transgress even on pain of death. 
right? That's the famous law that Rambam brings it down at the very beginning of his Sefer. Uh, the Gemara speaks about it. This is Halakha al said that if a person, if a person, if a goy or somebody, uh, f- you know, says to a Jew, you must idol worship or you must do a sexual immorality or you must uh, kill someone else, otherwise I will kill you, the law is that the Jew has to die. Whereas every other sin in the Torah, he's supposed to do. Again, there's exceptions, but yeah. It is. It is, yes, absolutely. It's one of the no-head laws. Idolatry is the, the, the first one, I believe, for them. They're not allowed to believe other, uh, not allowed to worship other gods. Okay? So, look at Note 29. It's from the actual Gemara, Masechet Arachin says this, that these three severe sins, it's very much related and similar to, says the Gemara over there, sinful speech. Speaking in Lashon Ara about, about your fellow Jews. How is that? Says the Ben Yehoida. Just as the sin of sinful speech is committed by the mouth, so too the suffering that they suffered in Yerushalayim at this time in history, during this three-year siege, was hunger addressed to the mouth. Right? Hunger is also connected to your mouth. You want to put something in your mouth so badly, you don't know, anything that comes to you, grab it. Midah keneged midah. Then he quotes his, uh, his own, one of his one of his fellow colleagues, as he says over here, Rabbi Yaakov, explained that this is also the reason why heaven supervised that the Caesar originally sent a tripled calf to be sacrificed at the temple to hint at their transgression of sinful speech as the cause for all of this. So if you remember back in chapter 6, which said all this, yes, the story of Kamsa and Barakamsa over there, the Caesar sent a calf, but the Gemara called it a tripled calf, Eglatil Ta'a. And we went over there and we explained what it was, what does that mean, tripled calf? Um, I have to look back in chapter 6. There's so many different explanations. Those are down like 3-4 explanations. Bottom line, it means like a really, really worthy, nice, juicy calf. Okay? Um, but one of the deep things that the Ben Yohada is pointing to here is that why is it called tripled calf? Triple, because it connects to the triple, the triplet of the three major sins. And that connects to sinful speech. Because in Masechet Arachim, it says those, those three in a certain way are equal to this. Now how that is... That requires a whole shiur on itself. I recommend looking at Rabbi Tatz. Rabbi Akiva Tatz, he has an amazing shiur on this. Uh, I think the topic of the shiur is called sinful speech, Lashon Ara, something like that. Where he explains to you the, the depth of this, 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 this uh, statement in the Gemara, that how can these three sins be on the same level playing field as, I'm mean, sorry, how can sinful speech, Lashon Ara, be on the same playing field as sexual immorality, murder, and idolatry? He explains there very deeply, and basically the, what the Gemara says over there is that if, uh, um, what the Gemara says over there, if I remember correctly, is that if a person is careful never to speak Lashon Hara, then he will be saved 100% in Ulam Abba. I mean, he, he, they, will, they will not be able to persecute him in Ulam Abba. Even if he, that sounds like he's doing all these other sins. If and Lashon Hara, he was an expert, and he shut his mouth, he didn't say a thing, ever, he will be saved from purgatory and from basically, punishment of the Lama Exactly, that's basically the, the theme of the, exactly, that's the theme. That just as he didn't open his mouth against anybody else, in Shemayin, they won't be able to open their mouths against him for what he did. Won't be able to. And that's how God created the world with that uh, a dynamic mechanism of justice. Whatever you do is given right back to you. Whatever you put out into the world is sent right back to you. That's how it works. Good. The Ben Yehuda continues, the reason that there were three rich men, right? Why, why specifically three? It could be five. Why was the three over there specifically? Is to hint at the three dots of the grammatical vowel called the Segol. Right? So we have nekudot in Hebrew. We have letters and vowels. The vowels go around the letters and they give you the sounds of what you're supposed to say in between the letters. One of them is called the segol. That literally looks like three dots. Like this, like this, and like this. Like a, a triangular three dots. Right? It makes an E sound. Which corresponds to the attribute of chesed. All these nekudot, by the way, have a deep Kabbalistic meaning behind them. Of course, everything has a deep Kabbalistic meaning behind it. And he says that this uh, vowel of segol connects to the, to the midah, to the attribute, to the sefirah, of Chesed. We explained that a little bit in 31, note 31. Hashem's name of essence, when vowelized with a certain vowel, corresponds to one of the attributes of the ten sefirot. So that means that, uh, what's, it, what's Hashem's name of essence? We're talking about the yud and the he and the vav and the he. 
<coughs> Excuse me one second. Right? So, in Kabbalah, when you take those letters, the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He, how you vowelize it uh, uh, underscores certain attributes. And activates, I should say, activates certain attributes. We never pronounce it fully. I know, but, we but you can have Kavana, you can, you can visualize the letters with the vowels in your head. You can't pronounce, you're not allowed to pronounce. Um, so for example, you can plug in any vowel in there, depending on which vowel you plug in, you're going to uh, activate a different sfira. Okay, a different emanation, different energy. Into the spelling of it. Again, you're just... But you're not. You're not pronouncing it. You're, not, you're always pronouncing the same. You're, you're always saying Amonai. Into the spelling. Into the spelling. Yes. You're, the words you're saying is still Aleph, then Dalit, then Nun, then Nun, then Yud, Amonai. Right. That's what you're saying. But what you're visualizing. Um, so if you take each letter, for example, and you put the the Segol that we're talking about under each letter, that points to Chesed. If you, for example, if you have a Shva under each letter, which is the two dots like this. Under each letter, that's Givura. If you have the the uh, Cholam, which is the one dot on the on the top left of the letter, it's the O sound. You put that on each letter of the Yud and the Hey and the Vav and the Hey. That's Tif Edit. Why that is deep things, but well, if if you look in certain Sidurim, especially especially Sfardi Sidurim, Sfardi Sidurim, such as this one, even this one, the famous Avodat oh, Hashem. Each beracha in the Amidah corresponds and is activated and is connecting to one of the sefirot. And you're going to see God's name, Aleph, I mean the He, and the Yud, and the He, the Bab, the He, it's vowelized according to the sefirah that it, that it corresponds to. It's there. Again, I'm teaching you some, uh, some, you know, this is beyond Kabbalah 101. But this really, uh, if you think about them and learn about them, it can really elevate your tefillah a lot more. Right, so if you look, for example, in the bracha of Atachonin Adam Daat, right, the first bracha of the middle ones, you go over there, Atachonin Adam Daat, Bruchata Hashem, Chonin Adat. If you look at the God's name over there, each letter is vowelized with a patach. Patach is the flat line. That corresponds to Chochma. Tells you right on top of the word. God's word. You, know, you never looked at it. Using the Siddur for years. You never really pay attention to what it says over here. Right? That connects to Chokhmah. You go to the next one. Hashivin Avinu Totecha, etc. Baruch Ata Hashem. Harotzeh Bit Shuva. And over there, under Hashem's name, it has the Tzere. Tzere is two dots. Under each one, that's Bina. So basically what you're doing, you're literally building the structure of the universe when you're saying Amidah. You don't even know what you're doing. What did you say? So go to Amidah. Any Amidah. I don't know if that Siddur is going to have it. This Siddur I know has it. Not every Siddur puts it in. No, but the Rawa, the, 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 the Nikudot. So you said, you said... Not every Siddur is going to put in the uh, Nikudot. Which, 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 I mean... Uh, you say, uh, which, which brother are you saying? Patachonin. Patachonin. Yeah. Baruch Hashem, you have Patachs. That's Chokhmah. Go to the next one. Harutzeh okay. B'tshuva, see? That's tzere, has Tere underneath, two dots. Yeah, wow. That's Bina. Go to the next one, that's the one we're learning about. Salah Na'avinu. What are we asking? Salah Na'avinu. God, please forgive us. Give us forgiveness for our terrible sins. What do you have under there? Baruch Hashem, Segol under each one. Hanun the, the, the graceful one who has um, abundant in forgiveness, we're calling God. Why? Because you need Chesed. What is Chesed? I explained to you what is chesed before last, in the last shiur. We're going to talk about this a lot in every, almost every chapter. But chesed is, what's the basic definition of chesed? No. They're, so they're related. Chesed is, is it giving or taking? It's ultimate giving. Exactly. Ultimate giving, but giving beyond what is deserved. Giving just because, just take it, take it. I want to give you and take it. Unconditional. Rachamim is, listen, I want to give you, but I want to give you enough so that you can build independently on your own. That's Rachamim. You understand? So Chesed, this Barakha, we're asking God, please, you're so abundant in forgiveness, please forgive us. Meaning, even if we don't deserve it, activate your Chesed, God, and unconditionally just forgive us. You understand? That's one clue into 
how deep the Amada really is. You charge money for this one. Or for the shiur? <laughs> 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 uh, this is a master of money. Okay. So now, these three men had the capability to conduct complete chesed, says the Ben Yehoyada. He says over here, why is the three men? Because the three men, each one is representing one of the dots of the segol, which all together the segol is representing chesed. Segol has three dots, right? Three men. These three men had the capability to conduct complete chesed. They were ultimate chesed. But these people, meaning the people of the, of the, uh, of the city, no, he's referring to the bayonim. The bayonim pushed this chesed away in their ungratefulness. They literally could have survived and waited out the Romans for 21 years. The Romans would have got tired, too many resources, they're paying too much money for these soldiers, and it would have been, they, would have, they would have gave up. Who? The, the Bayonim? You can, you can make that argument, sure. Next paragraph in the Binyan Huda, it seems that the Zealots, Bayonim, same word, I'm just, I'm just interchanging. They wanted to fight the Romans because they were confident that they would win. Based on the words of Yitzchak Avinu, who said, the voice is the voice of Yaakov and the hands are the hands of Aesav. Right? Famous pasuk that he says when, uh, when Yaakov walks in and he has the goat skin on his arms and Yitzchak says, let me feel you, my son. Are you really my son, Aesav? And then he feels... His arms, he says, the voice that I'm hearing is the voice of the voice of Yaakov, but the hands are the hands of Isaac. We have a whole chapter, chapter 17, talking about that pasuk and the depth of it. We'll see there. But here, he says over here that the Baryonim, they were relying on this pasuk, which conveys, it teaches the message that when the voice is the voice of Yaakov, meaning that when the children of Israel, which is the Jewish people, children of, children of Yaakov, which are the Jewish people, when they are using their voices for the learning of the Torah, then the hands of Esav, which is the verse is talking about, of whom the Romans are the descendants, right? Esav are the Romans. Those hands will not be able to defeat them, right? So that's what the condition is. The voice of the voice is Yaakov, and the hands of the hands of Esav. That means if the voice of the Yaakov continues to be the true voice of Yaakov, of learning Torah, which they had at the time of the temple, then they thought the hands of Esav, which is the Romans, won't be able to touch us. Note number 33, just to uh, clarify what he just said, note number 33, the Ben Yehudah is referring to a classic drasha on this pasuk 27, 22 in Bereshit, the voice is the voice of Yaakov in the hands of the hands of Esav, that when the voice of Yaakov, the Jewish people, is present in the houses of prayer and study, Bet Midrash, Bet Knesset, their voices, that's our ultimate weapon. When it's doing what it's supposed to do, then the hands of Esav, which are the enemies of Israel, they have no power over them, and also vice versa, right? That's based on Bereshit Rabbah, that's a Midrash. Chapter 17 is going to give you full more stuff on that. So the Ben Yehuda is saying, that, is saying that, that's what they were relying on. The Baryonim said, we have this on our side. We don't worry about it. We're going to beat them. However, our Gemara mentions that the sages retorted back to them that the matter would not be successful. They said, listen, we know that if we go to war with them, we're not going to win. Why? They thought so. The Chachamim said this. Because of the prevalent transgression of sinful speech among the people, which is also conducted with the voice and the mouth. Which means, listen, they were telling the Baryonim, we may have Torah, we may be learning Torah, but with the same organ that we're learning Torah with, our voices, we're also detrimenting, destroying with Lashon with each other, divis- the, the divisiveness. And this was cou- counteracting the Torah that was produced with their voices, thereby allowing the hands of Esav to reign. That's how he explains that. Now the next thing he's going to explain here is the difficulty with Rashi. So Rashi and our Gemara, Rashi said, First of all, what did the Gemara say? The Gemara said at the very end that the Baryonim burnt the storehouses of barley and wheat. That's it. That's what it says. Rashi says, oh, you know what else they burnt? The storehouses of the wood. Rashi just adds that detail. All the, chacha, all the uh, commentators from last week, also a week before, they jumped on him. They said, hold on a second, Rashi, how do you know that? That's not what the Gemara says. So the Ben Yehudah is going to try to settle that. He says here, in order to settle the difficulty with Rashi, additionally mentioning wood, we must say that this is what happened. This is the, how the Ben Yehuda wants to settle everything. He says, The storehouses of wood encircled the storehouses of wheat and barley. That was how they were set up. That was the structure. On the outside, they had the wood storehouses. On the inside, they had the barley and wheat storehouses. And the Baryonim lit the storehouses of wood. They're very flammable, right? 
which created a large wall of fire around the storehouses of wheat and barley due to the combustible nature of wood, preventing anyone from grabbing any wheat or barley for themselves before it all burnt as well and went to waste. So he's saying that's what happened. He's saying they really burnt the wood, but it eventually spread to the inside and burnt the wheat and barley. So that's how he wants to settle Rashi with the Gemara. This is how the famine started immediately, right? Forcing war upon the people as the zealots intended. This is, that's what they wanted all along. They said, listen, the only reason why these Jews don't want to go to war with us is because they're relying on the resources. Ah, oh, we have enough wheat, we have enough barley, the, the Romans don't have enough, they're going to run away. How can they truly be considered zealots? If, <coughs> you know, the word passion means you, nothing's going to stop you, right? Yeah. You, the Jews are stopping you from doing what you wanted to do. You, why do you need them on your side? If I want to do something, I'm not going to wait for nobody. You have a group of people. I have a group of people. And I want to do it. I'm passionate about it. These group of people aren't going to stop me. So I don't think they were that passionate about it. Wait, again, you, you're, I think you're reading too much into it. They were passionate with one focus. And their focus was that we are going to go fight the Romans. All of us are going to go fight the Romans. That was their passion. We're going to beat them. And that's it. And they, that, that led them to make these conclusions that it's beyond you know, normal thinking. To burn the wheat. You're being sieged. You're going to burn the wheat? You understand? It's, that, that, that's what they're passionate about. It doesn't mean they, about exactly, that's what it is. Zealot doesn't mean passion. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean it's tzaddik. It doesn't mean it's It's whatever he is. He's passionate about that. That's what it means. For example, another person is called a zealot. A zealot in Russian. I'm sorry. In English. It's Pinchas. But Pinchas is tzaddik. So he was passionate about doing the right thing. And at that moment, when he killed Zimri with a spear, that was the right thing. That was the halakha. No one, no one else had the guts to do it. Right? So it's a good thing to be that, but it needs to be regulated and pushed towards the right direction. These guys were not. This is why Rashi added the fact that they burned, they burned, by the way, you know, I was, when I was writing this book, I learned so much about English. What's the proper way to say it? Burned, B-U-R-N-E-D, or burnt, B-U-R-N-T. English is such a difficult language, I'm telling you, it's the most confusing, nonsensical language. Technically, they're both, they're both correct. Technically, they're both right. So either one is fine. That's what I learned. So, when Rashi says that they burnt the storehouses of wood, hold on, this is why Rashi added the fact that they burned the storehouses of wood. For if we were to assume that they only burned the wheat and barley, storehouses, as our Gemara writes, then the famine would not have started right away. Since wheat and barley burned slowly, allowing the people ample time to go and grab some rations that would have lasted them some time before being forced to battle the enemy. So that's how he, he says it. He says, the, the fact of the matter is like this. The point of the Baryonim was to burn the wheat and barley quick, so that everyone else will have no choice but to go to war with them. If it burned slowly, then the other people could come and save some wheat and barley for themselves, and they could have survived a little longer, and they wouldn't have necessarily went to war with them. So that's why he explained the way he explained, Ben Yehuda, that the wood was around, and it made a wall, a wall of fire. They burnt the wood, which is around the wheat, and the wood fire made a wall of fire that blocked access for people to come take wheat, and then the wheat all burnt right away. And that's why they very quickly had to go to war. That's pretty much how he explains it over here. Baruch Hashem. So now we have about 20 minutes to do the Chatza Yosef. It's only about uh, two pages. Not too bad. We're gonna, we're gonna, it's two pages, but there's some deep things that we want to explain over here. Some deep things. Okay. Chatza Yosef says, we're on page 82. All the questions that we had in the Gemara, we said in the first part of this lecture series. I don't want to repeat them now, but I'll mention them as we go along. There's a lot of important questions here. Regarding the reason why the siege lasted three years, we may say that it was three years corresponding to the three... So we're adding a new answer. So the three left-handed acts of Din committed by Kamsa, Bar Kamsa, and the host which we detailed back in chapter 6, right? Meaning we said over there that uh, why does it have to say yad? Why does it have to say hand? Why did it, because it says over there that, 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 that uh, the host lifted Bar Kamsa up by hand and threw him out. 
Who cares by hand, by foot? Who cares how he did it? Just say he threw him out. So we explain because the hand represents deen. What were the two other acts? So the first act was the host who threw him out. The second act was based on the backstory that we explained, that we offered, of why the, these three guys hated, you know, had this uh, issue with each other. We said over there that there was a time that, uh, that Bar Kamta wanted to uh, ask Kamta for money and Kamta refused. That was a left-handed act. That was a deen. Then there was a time, then we said after that, Bar Kamta refused the host. Because the host was associated with Kamta. So he said, just like your friend didn't give me, I'm not going to give you. Cutting the hand? Oh, that, no, that was after the story. It was after the fact. That was after. That was chapter, after section two. That was, that, was, that, was, that was section two. All this we said in section one. And then the, the third left-handed act was the host kicking him out. Acts of Deen. Three acts of Deen. We said, it says the very, very famous pasuk in Mishle. Chuta Meshul, I'm sorry, in Kohelet. Chuta Meshulash lo bimrayanatik. Which means a three, a three ply cord doesn't easily disconnect. Once you establish something on three, that's where Chazaka comes from. The, the concept of Chazaka and Halakha. Once you have something three times, it's almost a guarantee and it's hard to break it. Right? So that's the same thing here. Three left-handed acts. The, 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 the deen, the judgment from Shemaim came down for the destruction. And we can say that it, this corresponds to the three rich men as well who are inside the temple. The nature of... A, I'm sorry. We're saying that this corresponds to the three years. Why three years? The siege itself is a deen as well. It's a deen. It's a judgment. It's a harsh deen that came down from Shemaim. Also connected to the three left-handed acts like we said before. The nature of a siege is that it restricts movement in and out of the city, right? They block you out, so no one comes in and out, so you, they, they starve you out. So too, the attribute of deen is that of limitation and restriction. That, that's what deen is all about. It's the opposite of chesed. Chesed gives, deen holds back, restricts. That's why it's all connected. Next chapter, uh, I'm sorry, next paragraph. Regarding the significance of the three rich men, their names and what they donated, right? The Maharal laid out a fantastic foundation for the deeper understanding of them. He posited, he explained, the Maharal, that the wood was praised by the rabbis because it was the most abundant and thereby had the highest potential to achieve the most giving. Right? That was, he, we didn't have much other answers for that, but we said, why is the wood the most important? Maharal said simple, because it was the most abundant. The most, they had the most of it. The more you have of something, the more opportunity and potential you have to give it. The more mitzvahs of giving you can accumulate with it. That's why I said wood. That's what, that's why the Maharal said that wood is uh, was praised the most. But in our humble opinion, we may expand this, his explanation more with the following. And now you're going to understand why we we named the title of this section "Fuel on Empty." The primary usage of wood is fuel, fuel, and that is exactly what the rabbis praised. The commodity of fuel. As the Maharal explained, the resources that were donated were split into three groups, each given by one of the wealthy men. Right? He said that, that uh, Naktimon ben Gurion gave the wood, Ben Kabasavua gave the wheat and barley, and Ben Tzitzit Keset gave the wine, oil, and salt. Uh, note one quickly, I have to just mention this. Note one on the bottom. The Maharal actually did not, did not mention the salt, Maharal only said wine and oil. Based on his presentation, it makes sense to group salt along with the wine and oil since they are similar in that they, add, they have flavor. That was his whole thing. He said that wine and oil have flavor, and so salt is definitely a flavoring thing. Right? While, while plain bread is made from grain, that's just made from grains and water, is not associated with flavor. So that was uh, just an inference we had to make. Anyway, three rich men, each one gave a group of, of certain products. When comparing wine, oil, and salt, to wheat and barley, right, those two groups. The wheat and barley takes precedence. We have to say it's more important. Why? Because they produce bread, which is the staple of sustenance. Parnassah is about the bread. You can't live off salt. You can't live off wine, right? Or you can't live off oil. While wine, oil, and salt are luxuries to an extent. Not necessary for survival. It is because they are luxuries that they carry with them a status of importance in terms of nobility, right? And important people want these things, especially in their times, wine, oil. But a lower importance in the context of, this, of survival, which is the context of our Gemara. Our Gemara is talking about survival. When it comes to survival, bread is much more valuable 
and much more necessary than wine, oil, and salt. Next, when we compare the wheat and barley versus the wood, the wood is more praiseworthy because it is the fuel that makes the wheat and barley usable in the first place. Right? The wood is burnt for fire. If you don't have the wood, you can't roast the kernels. You can't bake the dough. You got nothing. Without the wood as fuel, the wheat and barley are not usable for their intended purpose. You could try to, you know, chew on raw wheat, but you're going to break your teeth. Okay? And you come to my office after that. <clears throat> Thus, the hierarchy of importance in the, context, in the context of our Gemara, from lowest to highest, is, the lowest is wine, oil, and salt, then wheat and barley, then wood. Rav Chasta's statement in our Gemara indicates this hierarchy as well. Since he says 60 parts of wood is needed for one part of wheat, meaning wood is more essential than wheat. And he omits. Like, wouldn't you do it based on the, per- like, the fraction, basically the percentage? You can do more mitzvot, but it's technically acquaints to one. So if I have one storehouse of wheat, like, whatever, one portion of wheat for one family, one piece of bread, whatever it is. <coughs> 60 pieces of wheat for it, uh, 60 pieces of, of wood for it, technically I only did one mitzvah, because I, that 60 pieces are going to, to one meal. No. No? No. Not necessarily. You want to look at it that way? No. Technically. It's one mitzvah. You help one person cook it for you. So you're saying the wood should be equal to the wheat? In terms of uh, the fraction percentage, right? Be- well, not necessarily because the wheat, the wood has the wood is fuel not just for baking but also for many other things. For 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 making fire, they could they would make tools from it because you need fire to to melt the metal. They would uh, warm themselves up at night. They, they would make fire uh, torches. So many other there's so many other uh, uses for the fire besides just cooking the wheat. Okay, so this is over here. Uh, so Rav Chaz's statement on Gemara indicates that this hierarchy as well since he says 60 parts of wood is needed for one part of wheat meaning that wood is more essential than wheat and he omits wine and salt com- and oil completely from the, co- from the comparison indicating that they are uh, the least essential as we explained on the bottom he didn't mention those so they must be the least okay thus the wood is fuel which is the what is fuel now we're talking, what is fuel in general the idea of fuel it is the actualization of potential, which is surely the most praiseworthy. <clears throat> praiseworthy. What something could become is negligible if it never becomes. Fuel is the catalyst that unlocks the potential of that which it fuels. Okay? It's the catalyst. This reveals why our Gemara gives the example of Rav Chasta who would withhold the key to his wood storehouses from his servant. He kept the key to himself due to its great worth, because that is exactly what the, what the wood as fuel does. It is the key. Do you understand? That's why the Gemara talks about wood as fuel in context of a key. Rav Chazda has a key that he would never give. Why? Because the wood is the key. Wood is the key that unlocks the benefit of the food that it cooks or bakes. It unlocks the potential within. Okay? Fuel is the external component. Fuel is the outside thing infused with the actual item that, it, uh, that is needed for the item to perform its desired function. We'll explain more. The downside of fuel is that it gets used up. Right? It's limited, and then you have to replace it. You have to fill up your car once in a while, right? You have to change the batteries. Because of this nature, because fuel is so important, but it doesn't last, it is often forgotten, not given its proper acknowledgement, and it's not viewed as importantly as the thing that it is fueling itself, right? For example, a car. You have your car. An amazing car. Expensive car, whatever you want. But if all of a sudden, the economy of oil and gas, like kind of like it's right now, goes terrible, I mean, not, right now it's okay, but if it gets really, really bad where the, 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 the supply is so short, there's no supply anymore, then what, what becomes the value of your car? You can't move your car. People forget about the importance of the fuel, but only when there's a, a big gas crisis, 
people realize, wow, you know. Actually, during this gas crisis, the value of smart, like cars that are fuel efficient, went up. Right. Gas cars, the prices of those cars went down. Went exactly. That that exactly illustrates my point. That without the fuel, the thing itself is 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 useless. So don't forget about how important the fuel is. In this sense, the importance of fuel is nullified, right? Because people ignore it because when they have plenty of it, they ignore it. Ah, the car is more important thing, right? The importance of fuel is nullified in comparison to the thing it fuels in that sense. Thus, when Rav Chasda states in our Gemara that 60 storehouses of wood are needed for one storehouse of wheat, he does not mean so literally. Because think about it, it's a lot. You don't need that much wood just to bake a little bit of bread. Yeah, if I'm baking this much bread, you're telling me I need this time 60 wood? I wouldn't know. I don't know. You, that. you ever, uh, hold on, you ever cooked in a, in a, a plof in the, what's the thing called? Yeah. I don't what's, the thing, what's the Bukharian word for it? The kazan, big kazan, what's it called? I forgot, I got to ask my, my, my dad. But the point is, you don't, you don't put... The, they put a couple of people, but how much plof do they have over there? A lot of plof. The, the pieces of the wood also matter. It's but I'm saying quantity-wise, of course it matters. I'm talking quant- it's not 60 plof. times. Plof feeds a lot of people, yes, correct. It's not 60 times. It's, that's my point. So, so what Afghaz is teaching here, when it says 60 times, he's not meaning literal. He's trying to teach you something here. A concept. What is he teaching you? When Amakhasta states in our Gemara that 60 storehouses of wood are needed to, for one storehouse of wheat, he does not mean so literally. Rather, he is only hinting at the halachic principle that, one, that when one species of item is mixed into another species of item that is greater than it by a ratio of 60 to 1, that item is what we call nullified, batel. Wow. 1 in 60, right? For all intents and purposes, we treat it as nullified as if it's no longer present. Right, famous example, you have a big meat soup, some milk falls in, a little cup of milk, as long as you have 60 times of the meat, of the pot and everything in there, the, versus the, that milk, the milk becomes nullified, it's allowed, it's mutar, it's nullified, 1 in 60, right, the, the famous lore. Same thing here. So the barley or the wheat was nullified? So, so look, we're going to explain. In the same oh, way, the so look, it's nullified because people forget about it. But the 60 people, isn't the part that gets nullified, it's the, the one that gets nullified. And since the 60 being the fuel. It's a drasha. Don't dig too much. It's a drasha. In the same way, wood, which represents the concept of fuel, often goes unnoticed in its importance and is nullified opposed to the thing that it fuels. Look at note number three. Good, uh, very astute uh, 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 you know, observation, Rahamim. Granted, the ratio of Chaz dimensions is 60 parts wood versus one part wheat meaning that wheat would be nullified by the wood, whereas we have presented it as the wood, I'm sorry, whereas we have presented it as the wood, the concept of fuel being nullified, right? So we're talking about the, the reverse way. But as we mentioned, Rav Chasta did not mean so literally, rather he just meant to hint at the concept of nullification, which is 60 to 1 to ratio in general. And he could, he, he could not have made this statement in the reverse, because realistically more wood is needed for, fu- uh, for fuel than wheat to bake bread. Right, so he couldn't say you you need this much wood to bake this much bread. It's not true. You need a little bit more wood, so he couldn't say the opposite. He couldn't say you need sixty times wheat for wood, because it's, it's just that'll be kind of, sixty you know of wheat for a little. Conceptually, wouldn't go. It wouldn't go. So again, this is the drasha. This that's how we defend our drasha. You, you're open to argue against it. I, I I I I'm open to arguments. I'm not, but this is how I explain it. Okay, so now. As the Maharal mentioned, wood has no flavor and its value is easily forgotten since it leaves no lasting impression. So in that sense, it gets nullified. That's why he talks about 60 to 1 because nullification, that's why he calls it a key because what is the key that unlocks? It's the fuel. Fuel is the key that unlocks the potential of the thing it fuels. Good. A little bit more. Perhaps along these lines, we can settle the difficulty with Rashi who commented that the Baryonim also burnt down the storehouses of wood, even though the Gemara makes no explicit mention of it. The Gemara just said the wheat and barley. The Ben Yohira does attempt at settling Rashi, assumes that the storehouses of wood were situated around the storehouses of wheat and barley. Right? That's, that's how the Ben Yohira said that. He said, therefore they burnt the, wheat, the wood, and the wood made a wall around the wheat, and then that's how it happened. That's how he explains it. 
<clears throat> but we can offer a simpler and more direct settlement of Rashi thus. Rashi just means to underscore the importance of the wood as fuel. That's it. How? If the Baryonim had only eliminated the produce, meaning the wheat and barley, while leaving the wood alone, it was feasible that they could have grown more produce. Right? It takes about a year to grow. They lasted three years. right? And eventually, they would have consumed whatever they grew more, the wheat and barley, via the fuel of the wood, which still remained. They still had the wood. As long as they still had the wood, they could grow new produce and cook it and live. That is why Rashi was inclined to throw in the fact that the Baryonim must have also destroyed the storehouses of wood. It must have happened. Rashi says there's no other way. It had to happen. Since once the wood was gone, even if they had grown more, wheat, more produce, it would have been impossible to make use of it. If you have no gas, no matter how many cars you build, the cars are useless. When the resource of wood was eliminated by the Baryonim, the non zela groups, the other Jews, were, th were thrown over the edge. That's it. They had to throw the uh, you know, arms in the air. What else are they going to do? At that point, they knew there was nothing left to do but to succumb to the war machine that was Rome. In a spiritual sense as well, we can say that as long as the people of Jerusalem knew that they had enough rations to bear the siege for 21 years, they had hope. Right? As long as this is before the Bayonim burnt down everything, they had hope. They said we could survive. Hope is the ultimate what? What is hope? It's the ultimate fuel. The motivation that keeps one grinding through adversity, focused on accomplishing one's goal. Once the storehouses of produce were eliminated, that fuel in the form of hope was also lost. You understand? Perhaps on a deeper level, Rashi meant to hint that just as the wood storehouses were eliminated, so too crushed was the hope of the residents trapped within the city's walls. The hope, the hope is connected to, to the fuel, and that's what Rashi perhaps is trying to hint at when he said that they burnt the wood. Last paragraph here in this chapter, in this section. On a deeper note, the Maharal explained how each of the three wealthy men corresponded to a certain attribute of Hashem. One was Chesed, one was Din, one was Rahamim. Right? That was last week. We explained that in detail. These are these are these aren't mm. these aren't um, Sfirot. These are these are Sfirot. Rahamim is not Sfirot. Yes, it is. Rahamim is Tefirot. It's Tefirot. It's, it's, it's Tefirot. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's another word, another name. Just like uh, Din is Gibura. Okay. Same thing. Rahamim is Tefirot. Naktimon ben Gurion, the one who donated the wood, corresponded with Chesed. Right? That's what the Maharal said as well. This accords well with what we have established here as well. Since in the triangular dyna dy the dynamics, the way those three work, Chesed, Din, Rachamim, the drive that keeps it all going, as we will explain in other later chapters, the drive that keeps it all going is Hashem's desire to bestow Chesed. That whole system of chesed din and rachamim is just a manifestation of God's will. And God's will was to bestow chesed upon the creations. He wants to give chesed to them. But, I mean, I don't want to go into it now. But all the, all the steps of that, those three steps, three phases, which we're going to go deep in chapter 15, B'zat Hashem, of chesed, then din, then rachamim, is all to reveal the goal that God wants to give. It starts with chesed, a lot of giving. Then it stops by din, where God takes it away. That's an important step in the process, because now you have to know what you were missing. You understand? Then rachamim is when God says, okay, now you're going to build it on your own. I'm going to give you exactly how much you need so that you can build yourself. Okay? That's basically what happens. The stages of any process in the universe unfold thus. Chesed, then Din, then Rachamim. That order that I just mentioned, of first an amazing amount of endless giving, kind of look like what they call beginner's luck. Whenever you try something for, for, for the first time, you're so good at it. Why? That's the Chesed phase. Then, you're terrible. Din. Then, you've got to earn it. Rachamim. No, it's Chesed, Din, Rachamim. So this process, if you really analyze the universe, it's literally everywhere. 
literally. You have to learn more about the process of how it works and what it is, which we will do eventually, not for now. But once you learn that, you, you, you're going to start analyzing not only the world around you, the Torah, Pesukim, all these questions, all these things, themes that come up, it's all dictated by that process. We should get there and we shall explain it soon. The stages of any process. All right. So Rachamim is the end goal of the process. And the purpose of Rachamim is only to reveal the best form of Chesed. Of the Chesed. Note 4. This is why the best form of Tiferet, which is uh, Rachamim as well, like we said, which is the balance. Tiferet is the balance between Chesed and Din. The best form of it is when the blame is, is when the balance is not perfectly centered, but rather it's slightly tilted towards chesed. Towards the right. That's why everything we want to make towards the right. We do everything in Judaism towards the right, to the right, right hand always. For that, that idea. Except for tefillin, that's for another reason. Thus, chesed, similar to the function of fire, is, um, I'm sorry, chesed is similar to the function of firewood. It is the catalyst of the process. We just said firewood is the fuel. Catalyst that takes out the potential. Chesed is also the catalyst of the whole three-step process that you find everywhere in the world. That's the catalyst. That's what God wants to reveal. As it says, next page, Ki amarti olam chesed For I have said the world will be built by an chesed. And built by chesed. That is a very famous verse that the Kabbalists always, always uh, quote. To teach this content. The chesed is the first step of the lower seven. Of the physical world, chesed is the first building block. The first layer of cement that goes down. Everything else is gold, goes on top of that. It is the catalyst. It is the goal of what God, God wants to give. But, it, but if we just give the chesed and end the story there, it would, it would not be as meaningful. Because you didn't deserve it. You get the chesed, you didn't deserve it. That's why you have to go through the rest of the steps. And the rest of the steps refine and perfect that chesed. These themes are the foundation of all existence. And although they seem vague now, they will be revisited and given their due diligence in their proper places in the coming chapters, Be'ezat Hashem Barach, especially in chapter 15. And that is the end of section 1, chapter 8. Next week we're going to start section 2, Be'ezat Hashem, where the continuation of the tragedies that are going on inside Yerushalayim will be told by the Gemara, and we have a lot to learn there as well. Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.